So I, I'm delighted to welcome Judith Roden here for another visit uh, to this Duke program. Judy has a, been a frequent visitor in the past and has always enlightened and delighted us by her presence. Uh, she's a pioneer, innovator, change maker, and global thought leader. For two, over two decades, Judy led and transformed two global institutions. Uh, I, I better, I, did, I had to cut off the phone. I forgot to do that. The two global institutions, the University of Pennsylvania and the Rockefeller Foundation. Her leadership at Rockefeller ushered in a new era of strategic philanthropy that emphasized large scale partnerships with business and government to address and solve for the complex challenges of the 21st century and championed two new fields that are at the forefront of thinking, resilience and impact investing, the latter of which we'll talk more about today. Um, in addition, uh, Dr. Roden has served as a board member of nine leading public companies, including Citigroup, Comcast, and Aetna, um, and I think American Airlines too, if I remember correctly, not on my list, uh, as well as numerous venture capital backed startups and nonprofits, profits, including the Brookings Institution. She's been the recipient of 19 honorary degrees, um, numerous prestigious honors, and is a sought after speaker for influential global forums, including the World Economic Forum, the United Nations General Assembly, and the Vatican Global Forum. Dr. Roden has authored more than 200 academic articles and chapters, and has written, a co uh, written or co-written 15 books, including the, the Resilience Dividend, Being Strong in a World Where Things Go Wrong, and the current one, which she's gonna talk about, I think focus on today, Making Money Moral. It's a wonderful title. I wish I had thought of that myself. Um, how a new wave of visionaries is linking purpose and profit. So let me welcome all of our guests. Uh, and uh, and I'd like to move on to the discussion. We're not going to introduce in individuals today because there are too many. But uh, when you, if you have any questions to ask, when you ask questions, just tell us who you are when you do so and any affiliation that you want to add. So. I'd like to welcome. I'd like to ask you to welcome Dr. Judith Roden, um, uh, and also um, the. I will ask. Judy is going to speak for a period of time, and then we'll have questions from the audience as well as questions from me. Um, so, why don't we begin, Judy? Welcome again to Duke. This visual, virtual presentation. It's a wonderful to have. Wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Joel. It's delightful to be here. It's just great. And I know that you have questions for me, so I'm not going to make any opening statement. I'm going to let you start with your questions because I think that'll give us a great flow for the conversation. That'll be great. Okay. My first question is, I know that you started at the Rockefeller Foundation in 2005. You and your colleagues initiated a global analysis and strategic planning process. Was your interest in double bottom line investing or triple bottom line either ignited during that process? Uh, it was indeed. Uh, when I came in 2005, it was basically the beginning of a new century. And I was very struck as I went really through the archives and came to understand the founding of the Rockefeller Foundation and the thinking that John Dee and his colleagues really had at the time about what the nature of philanthropy would be, but also what the mission of the Rockefeller Foundation was set out um, and expressed as. And it was for the betterment of mankind. And they debated um, through that founding period, the will and why they had such a kind of generic maybe, but certainly general um, mission, was that they really hoped that their successors in every generation would debate and pick the big thorny problems of that era and would try to wrestle down those problems. And really stimulated by that, um, once again, uh, with a change in leadership, 
my colleagues and I set out to really consult with a broad array of experts from around the world. We commissioned research papers, we held panels, kind of did um, in common political parlance, listening tours um, with beneficiaries around the world. And it was really striking and it definitely helped us to identify the very significant substantive areas in which we either continued working or began new work, um, uh, affordable health care, food insecurity, but increasingly the interface between food insecurity and food waste. But in addition to identifying the substantive areas, we kept hearing from the experts two overarching themes. One was that there was not enough money in philanthropy and development together, that in the aggregate, it was only billions of dollars, and that that was insufficient to really solve the significant problems of the 21st century. And certainly that idea gained resonance after the SDGs, when they were actually priced, and it was very clear that that was not going to be possible with billions. Um, and second, that there had been many retrospective reports, including one done by the World Bank itself, that was pretty damning um, um, and critical of its own interventions and other interventions in philanthropy and development. Because when the money from the philanthropy or the development entity left, the interventions were often not sustainable. And so there was neither the resource nor the infrastructure built um, for uh, those interventions to gain sufficient traction over time. And because of that, we asked ourselves and we asked the experts, well, if there are billions of dollars, we know there's trillions and trillions of dollars in the world, where's the rest of the money? Um, I'm being glib, but essentially that was the relevant question. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's in the private sector, um, that private capital is the remainder of the money that is outside philanthropy and government, um, and that that is in the trillions, and that it would be so creative and interesting to figure out a way to engage that private capital in really significant amounts. Um, towards environmental problems, social problems, racial injustice, gender equity, all of these issues that we wrestle with as foundations, um, which the private sector didn't or was only in some areas beginning to see as potentially investable areas. So it really was that questioning. Um, we commissioned the Monitor Institute then to do a report for us really laying out the question of, could you, could you really have double bottom line or triple bottom line investing, um, or was that a pipe dream? Well, that leads to a seminal meeting that you convened at the Bellagio Conference Center in 2007, where the term impact investing was coined. Tell us about that meeting and why it was important. It was a critical meeting because as I said, it wasn't clear to us we didn't truth proof, um, except through the Monitor Institute work, directly with investors, whether this idea had resonance. And so we brought together both those who were early in it, which tended to be um, family offices, high net worth individuals um, who were doing it kind of on their own and very nascent impact investing funds like Leapfrog at the time and a few others. But we also brought some of the big guns. So uh, the private wealth team from JP Morgan Chase, um, a huge team from BlackRock, a, a very large team from Credit Suisse, because we wanted to truth proof the question um, with the big investors, as well as those who already had shown some commitment. They coined the term impact investing, and they said this field needs to be strategically developed, that it can't be developed willy-nilly um, because A, it will take too long, B, you won't get the results quickly enough to bring others in or to really create the kind of proof points 
that um, even motivated investors would need, let alone the skeptics. And so, um, and that the supply side, if you will, is what needed to be organized. That clearly the demand side was there. There are always problems. We have problem solvers, small companies, entrepreneurs, um, but it's the supply side, the capital, um, that really needs some strategic infrastructure built. And then that led you at the Rockefeller Foundation to develop a program in impact investing. How did you approach that work and what kind of funding did you do? Um, over a few years, three or four years, I think, we spent about $50 million to uh, do essentially what we were advised at that Bellagio meeting, which is why we consider it so important. Uh, and that is to build the infrastructure of the field. And uh, it was critical. We built a team internally, um, many of whom had had uh, development or banking experience, um, some uh, coming from NGOs and, and uh, wonderful um, on the ground beneficiary entities, uh, but they were all to do the same thing. And that was to really ask in a very creative and formative way, what the field needs, not only what the field needs, how do we make a field? How do we create a field and then build what that new field actually needs? And so the funding over those few years included uh, building out the platform that is now the Global Impact Investors Network, because it was very clear that no single investor, even the large banks, at the, that early stage, wanted to put the resources in alone that it would have taken to make these kinds of investments really easily, both the due diligence on the impact side um, and uh, uh, really finding um, those kinds of early stage opportunities. So the gin was built and our early uh, partners in, in building the gin were JP Morgan and DFID, um, the British aid agency and then many others came in. And that robust platform, as, as I think you all know, is still exists, um, is doing great work and uh, continues to be really important in the field. We funded the early, very early creation of the first metrics. So IRIS and GEARS, um, both the standards for what impact measurement would look like, um, as well as the standards for what uh, performance on the impact side would be, as well as on the financial side. And those ratings, while still somewhat in use, have spawned now, um, all these years later, a huge ratings industry. So 600 different ratings and counting, um, unfortunately, now exist. And it's part of the growth of the field. But I think part of the problem of the field as well. Um, we supported a number of research papers on policy. It was very clear that unless some policy changes were made, for example, what the minimum requirement was for um, pension funds to get returns, what minimum level of returns uh, they needed every year and, and the like. Uh, and so, uh, we did a lot of policy work. We brought um, many accounting firms to the table. Again, we wanted a, a really referenceability very early um, in this field. And we kept funding pilots. Um, in the beginning, we thought maybe uh, impact investing was a single asset class, um, but we funded pilots across all the asset classes to really uh, foment innovation in this space. Um, we created a, an initiative a bit later called the Zero Gap Initiative that was all about um, giving really seed corn, 50 to $250,000 um, grants for innovation in every asset class. And so I used to kid with my colleagues that, you know, we're doing the plumbing. But that's what building the infrastructure of a field is, is really doing and is critically important. And I would say, and especially important for this group, 
that it was early and we made a strategic decision at that moment to do this as a program and use programmatic capital and not invest our endowment then um, because we felt the field wasn't ready. And so we didn't want to advocate and others were innovating like Calvert and Heron on the use of the endowment. So we felt we could do something different and with the leverage of their innovation around how the endowment would be used and our innovation around building the infrastructure, again, we could accelerate the momentum uh, of this field. Well, you, in your book, you've described very clearly and exhaustively um, uh, the, 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 the mo a mo new momentum in the field. What's caused the momentum around impacting investing to grow, to grow since the early days? Well, luckily, I think for us, the, the ecosystem changed. Um, and so there were many extrinsic factors, as well as intrinsic factors, our own work in building the platforms, the kind of work that Ronald Cohen and his colleagues were doing in the UK and ultimately building big society capital. The UN was trying to get companies to become signatories um, to a convention that would agree not to pollute the environment. That was another kind of early stage momentum builder. But I do think in addition to that, there really were some very compelling things. The first was clearly the rise of conscious consumerism from the fair trade movement to the sweatshop athletic apparel protests on college campuses, including um, a sit-in in my office in the 90s when I was president of Penn. Um, we were seeing, or protests at WTO meetings, we were seeing a lot of activism around the behavior of companies and consumers who said, we don't want companies to be doing that. We're not gonna buy products from companies like that. We're going to use our muscle and our cloud and our protest um, in order to change the behavior of those companies. And that was a very important element. Um, I think the second is sort of the moral worker um, increasingly. And certainly I watched a bit of the uh, congressional hearing today of the whistleblower against Facebook. Um, and I think there have been over time increasing, um, not only to get to a whistleblower stage, but employees are more activist. And certainly we saw a lot of that last year and that was growing. And as a, as a university president, many, many times I heard from students, I wouldn't work for a company like that. I don't, I don't really wanna do that. And that has grown tremendously in every country now. I just looked at some recent data um, and you know they're talking about many reasons why um, people aren't going back to the workforce. But one of them that I think is missed in the media is that people want, don't wanna go back to yucky companies um, who they really hate and think are doing hateful things. So um, that was part of it. Then I think we saw the rise of the conscious investor. So pension funds really came to feel, and, and I think we tried to help that, um, that if they are, especially um, the Japanese and the Nordic pension funds who were early to thinking this way, that really the reason they were formed is for the health, long-term health and well-being of their citizens, because these are national pensions. And if you really are charged with the health and well-being of your citizens, then you shouldn't want to make investments that pollute the environment, degrade the oceans, um, tear down trees, et cetera, et cetera. So they became very muscular over time. Um, and themselves advocated, um, said that they wouldn't hire many of them. They wouldn't hire money managers who invested in companies like this, et cetera, et cetera. So the money managers started to get religion. And then finally, there were some good companies early, but 
companies heard these messages and they began to change their own behaviors over time. Not all and not to the extent we need, um, but increasingly um, the companies themselves, both large and small, both public and private, have uh, accelerated the momentum that I think we're seeing now. Uh, in your book, you describe uh, the extent to which capital deployed for impact and sustainability that yield a double or triple bottom line is huge. Can you describe the, the investment, the, the types of investments that are being made and give us some examples that particularly excite you? Yeah, I, I want to emphasize now that uh, there's about $35 trillion of capital globally um, under management that has an impact or a sustainability label. So this is no longer a niche corner of the market. Um, this is enormous. And um, we are seeing these investments in literally every asset class. And that is quite extraordinary. So when I say every asset class, I mean every asset class of alternatives, um, natural resources, private equity, venture capital, insurance-backed securitization, all of these um, we now see uh, impact and sustainability investment. We see it hugely in the fixed income um, market, in the bond market. And we all know these labels, green bonds now and blue bonds, which are protecting oceans. Um, post last year, we're seeing more um, equity bonds, both racial equity bonds, economic equity bonds being sold. Um, we help develop uh, resilience bonds in a lot of parts of the world um, to build those capacities. So lots of fixed income. And then in the public equities, um, the enormous, the enormous explosion of ESG labeled funds. Um, as well as direct investments into public companies that um, have ESG or, or impact um, designations. So every asset class. Let me give you a few examples that I think are, are especially compelling. Um, one I didn't mention is um, REITs, Real Estate Investment Trusts. And um, one that I interviewed in the book and that I looked at really early was a collaboration between a very long-term investor in the real estate market, Bobby Turner, uh, with Magic Johnson, uh, the basketball grade. And Magic Johnson was concerned, and I think so accurately, and was doing at the time a lot of philanthropic work in LA. And he was concerned about um, the rental cost of housing um, for, actually for the people we're all now celebrating, the frontline social, you know, service workers, the nurses, the policemen, whomever, um, the firefighters, and a disproportionate share of their income goes for um, housing. And so they created a fund that would build sustainable, affordable, attractive housing for that group. Um, and they raised about $150 million in the first fund, which returned a, a, a nice real estate-like investment return to its investors, but was creating social good for that class. They then saw the potential of what they could do. And, you know, I admire this because this is something we would do and try to do in philanthropy too. They realized that if they had great housing, that they should offer on-site integrated services. So they built companies that not only built the housing, but offered health care and child care and early education tutoring, right integrated and, and all, many other services integrated into these very attractive housing units. Their investment portfolio grew. They returned very significant returns to their investors. They've been at this for 20 years. And um, the impact, and they measure impact now, and the impact is so significant, it's really impressive. Let me take uh, a quick one in the private equity venture capital space. Um, uh, Leapfrog 
invested early in Good Life Pharmacy, which was a pharmacy, a set of pharmacies um, at gas stations in Eastern Kenya. Um, many of the people in rural Kenya uh, cannot have, get health care. They don't have good access to health care, but they could go to these little pharmacies and sort of get the pharmacist or the healthcare worker um, to give them a diagnosis and sell them something. Leapfrog saw this as a tremendous business opportunity. And so they gave them investment capital, but more than that, they gave them their business experience um, and helped them to actually build a company. They created a modular pharmacy so that they could grow very quickly um, all over Kenya, Uganda, and then all through Eastern Africa. Um, they created within those modules the capacity to do telemedicine, to do nutritional counseling, um, and a variety of other things, and, and lately have actually put access to medical insurance information also within them. Um, they're the largest pharmacy chain now in all of Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, outside of South Africa. Now, that's something you know, we at Rockefeller would have tried to do with our grant money, but we never could have done it as quickly. Uh, we probably could never have taken it to scale. Good Life had tremendous business advice and LeapFrog's investors, all of whom were socially conscious and why they invested in the LeapFrog funds had a very high, maybe 12%, return on their money. So all of these demonstrations that you can do well and do good, that those are not competing goals, and it, it just works so well. And then you could also do it, now I'll stop after this, you could also do it if you had a particular focus. So let's say my focus was advancing women and girls. And so I, I now want to create my entire investment portfolio towards that end. There are an enormous number of opportunities to do that across the whole investment style continuum. So you could become an angel, an early stage investor in an entrepreneurial company and say, I'm only going to invest in companies that have women founders or you could put some money into venture capital and say, I'm only going to invest in companies that are working on certain goods and services that benefit women's reproductive health. Or you could buy a fixed income instrument, a bond. There are many bonds that now are focusing um, specifically on girls' education in rural areas in developing world countries. Or you could say, I want an exchange traded fund. I wanna be in the public markets and, and do something interesting. Well, there are lots of interesting things going on. Like the, in gender, um, there's a fund that uh, the YWCA and an investment group called Impact Shares co-created that uses the Morningstar gender equity and diversity scale um, to rate companies and only invest companies that are in the upper quintile of gender, uh, positive gender and diversity um, more generally. And then Impact Shares uh, gives the YWCA a piece of the carry so that the YWCA is getting back a percentage, which makes the investor more eager even if, if she or he has that motivation um, to put their money in that kind of, of ETF fund rather than uh, a different type. So you can see what's going on here. It's really like the sky's the limit in terms of creativity um, in the public and private markets at the moment. Are there other foundations that you can think of who've shown real commitment uh, to this field? Absolutely. I, I mentioned both Calvert and Heron early um, into this. Um, they really felt 
that they wanted their endowments aligned with their mission. And they were very early movers. Um, and they learned a lot, they studied a lot, and they created a lot of early evidence um, because they had been in it for a long time um, that many of the rest of us followed. I think the interest and the commitment accelerated, <laughs> excuse me, when both MacArthur announced that they were going to put 100 million um, of their endowment in. And then Ford, of course, announced they were going to put a billion of their endowment in these kinds of investments. And that really caught uh, so much significant attention um, in the field. And more generally, university endowments looked at what they had committed and began thinking about it as well. Um, I think the most recent statements I've read, and they're really brilliant and, and worth reading, um, I commend it to, to all of you, um, are Marla Blow's uh, statement when she took over the Skull Foundation um, and uh, Jamie Myers' statement when the Nathan Cummings, she's the chair of the board, when the Nathan Cummings Foundation decided to, again, align all of their endowment investing um, with their programmatic um, investments and their mission. And um, Marla is bringing Skull, which always used Capricorn, um, their investment arm to make climate investments uh, to racial and social justice investing as well. And it'll be very interesting to watch how that evolves. Jamie said that the uh, Cummings board did a lot of research uh, to try to really understand what impact they could have if they changed their strategy so fundamentally in terms of how they were uh, investing their endowment. And her statements um, in describing this in the Chronicle of Philanthropy caught me because of a recent occurrence. And that is, she said, a, our research showed us that the returns are very, very significant. And in fact, that investing this way mitigates long-term risk so that we're very excited by that idea. Secondly, that inadvertently when we did our research, we found that some of our endowment investments were sort of overriding, not intentionally and not directly, but some of our programmatic investments. And so we didn't want that inconsistency. But then she said something else, which was, we felt that if we used our endowment, we could be activists for change internally, that we didn't wanna walk away from companies that we thought were doing wrong, but that we wanted to deeply engage and get them to change and that our money was a tool to be able to do that. Um, and I, this is the contrarian view here. Um, I guess I find myself dismayed by Harvard's decision and some of the other uh, leading universities to disinvest in fossil fuels because it won't affect the companies. The companies will find other investors. Um, there's a lot of dumb, dumb money around chasing profit. Um, I'm struck by what engine number one did bringing BlackRock and State Street with them to get three deeply activist environmental um, board members onto the Exxon board in the last board election. And I think that that will have significant impact. And I think that's what Nathan Cummings now will do, that they will use board seats and internal activism um, of all sorts and use their money to effectively pressure those companies to change. And I think that's very powerful. Um, it's all really interesting and exciting. I, I think it's important to mention that there are critics uh, who question either the real returns being created or whether a lot of these claims are just, as you would say, greenwashing. Can you talk about the metrics in this area, their solidity and your views of these critiques? Um, I, I agree with the critical um, concerns. I, I, so many of us, I do 
uh, subscribe to the Bloomberg Green um, blog that comes out every day. And uh, they're always citing either another study or another group of activists complaining. And I, I think that's accurate. I do think that there's a lot of greenwashing um, and that it's particularly salient at this moment because there's so much emphasis and attention on climate change. And so a lot of companies want to look good or sound like um, they are making these kinds of commitments. And that's a little bit what we saw 10 years ago or 15 years ago when they made all these corporate social responsibility statements um, in their proxies uh, or at their annual meetings. But alongside that valid criticism is the fact that there has been, as I said earlier, an explosion of metrics. And those metrics um, are evolving, but they are in this point where A, a lot of them contradict one another. And so that's causing both some of the confusion in and criticism of the field at the present time. Um, and they are also, I think, um, uh, non-transparent in their reporting. And so a lot of the ESG claims in particular lack validation. Um, there's a, a really interesting shift that will move, two interesting shifts, I think, that will move this forward. One is, and this is so consistent with what we do in philanthropy, um, there's a trend now to move from impact measurement alone to impact management. So you don't just give the money and measure and walk away. You're deeply engaged with the problem solver you're funding, whether it's through philanthropic capital or through investment capital, um, private investment capital. And you're managing over time so that you can continue to increase the impact. Um, I, I uh, have a case study in the book of a team that developed out of the TPG Rise Fund um, called Y Analytics. And they do really sophisticated measurement that I'm quite excited about because they start with the kind of research that we all start with when we're launching new initiatives. And they assess then whether there's research and valid data that shows if you intervene here, you really could have impact and what the extent of the impact is, but the potential extent of the impact. And then they have a metric for, for the RISE Fund that says how much impact will the fund get for this amount of investment of its money? So they're not only asking and measuring an IRR on the capital, on the financial return, but they've developed sophisticated metrics and IRRs on the impact return. Something that in retrospect, I wish we did more of in philanthropy because it's really the same question, which is, are we getting the amount of impact that we think our investment should be producing, whether that's philanthropic capital or um, private investment capital. The second trend that I think is exciting is everybody sees this alphabet soup of, of um, 600 metrics or more. And so there's beginning to be a lot of collaborative entities working. And Cassie, if, if you could put up the slide, um, I just, I'm not going to go through this. I just want to maybe give you an idea of uh, what domains of collaboration are happening. So there's not-for-profit organizations um, that are collaboratives um, and universities like Harvard and others who are working together to try to develop standardized metrics. There's a number in the middle group of government task forces that are doing the same thing. Um, and it's great to see that both the G7 and the G20, although the G20 isn't on here, have task forces, the first for climate and biodiversity, and the second for impact, 
trying to standardize metrics. And I think that this will go a long way um, in the future and is very important. And then there's corporate um, uh, collaborations led by the accounting groups, the World Economic Forum and others, and many, many major companies, including Unilever and Salesforce, Bank of America, um, again, collaborating to consolidate these metrics. This is just in the ESG space, um, but it's going on across a variety of, of the impact spaces. This will make a big difference in mitigating the valid critiques about greenwashing, I think, because the measurements will be so much clearer. How about for investors who are seeking impact and sustainability outcomes um, and are learning from and perhaps changing their approach because of the organizations they're working with? Uh, you have, you have, you, so you have any examples of, of how they're going about doing that? Um, I do, and, and there are many, but the, the point, I think, which is really so interesting to observe is that in many cases, the investors are not just doing due diligence and picking a good company rather than a bad company, um, but they are actually sitting down with their potential investees and co-creating um, investable propositions that will really create dramatic change. So an early mover um, in this, for example, was the Danish pension fund, which has uh, about $50 billion under management at present. And um, the, Norwegian, the Danish oil and gas company, uh, which wanted to switch some of their production to wind, um, so moving, and this was quite early, uh, 2010, I think, to alternative energy. Um, the pension fund said, we love that you wanna do this. We don't want you to be an oil and gas company at all anymore. We're really impressed. And they sort of together figured out what each needed in order for this to happen. And so the company, which now is called Orsted, um, changed its name, said, we need loans to build wind farms. Uh, the uh, investment pension fund said, well, we don't do loans, we just do equity. And they worked out a way to convert the equity, uh, convert the loan into equity once the wind farm was built. The pension fund said, you know, we have a minimum threshold for a return each year because we know what our actuarial requirements are for payouts. Um, and so again, they worked out an agreement where no matter what the cost of the return on the cost of electricity was in any given year, um, the pension fund was guaranteed a certain minimum return. And if the company made more than X more than that threshold, they would take a disproportionate share of the profit. So it's not only that they transformed the company, um, it's that they completely transformed a way of working between an investor and a company that has been very long lived and, and has really made a difference. Um, one other quick example, uh, UNICEF and a, a group of um, uh, manufacturers in Europe, like H&M and Louis Vuitton and, and others, um, Adidas, worked with the Norwegian Pension Fund to get the influence of the pension fund to advocate for better labor practices in the manufacturing industry in the developing world. And the pension fund was a little reluctant to be that out front and take on that kind of responsibility. But with those three groups of actors, the willing companies, the expertise and data that UNICEF had on the ground uh, and the capital that the Norwegian bank fund had, they've been doing really remarkable things together. So this is about much more than how you deploy your money 
This is really about transforming, creating a systems transformation in the way capital and influence is used um, as this double and triple bottom line investing has, has taken hold. You talk a lot about the investor side, um, whether they're for-profit investors or foundations or others with money, but we haven't talked about nonprofits. Uh, we've talked. We can. What role do you see nonprofits as being able to play in this space, and whether they should or not? Can you talk about yeah, when this is happening and give us some examples that excite you? Yeah, I am excited about this because I think it is happening, and I think there are a variety of ways that we can see nonprofits and philanthropies play a role here. There was a very interesting study a year or two ago that just analyzed the SDGs and said how many of the subcategories of each SDG could represent investable propositions. Uh, not all, certainly not some of the human rights issues and a variety of others, but many more than I think uh, any would have expected. And so there are these opportunities. I'll give a couple of examples. Um, <clears throat> the Nature Conservancy, as we all know, has had a very long-term program um, in Appalachia, in central Appalachia, in Kentucky and Tennessee and Virginia. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, it's funded and has been for a very long time with philanthropic capital. Uh, they were particularly long standing actors in an area in Virginia around the Clinch River, which concerned them. It's a coal mining area. And it concerned them because it's the, the river is full of really endangered species that are very rare in North American rivers. Um, and so they creatively, and, and there's a lot of, uh, forest land and woodland also in this area. So they raised a $150 million <laughs> fund um, with an investment group. Uh, and most of the investors in the fund were uh, private individuals who care about the environment, care about nature, um, had been um, activists and philanthropists. Um, and with that fund, they bought about a quarter of a million uh, acres of forest. And they are now creating a sustainable timber forest. They are training the former coal miners to work in the sustainable timbering industry. So they're doing a lot of really exciting job creation. The river is sustaining itself because coal mining is, is um, not going on so much in the region anymore. And so the river is, is uh, doing better as well. The investor is paid back by carbon offsets and carbon credits, by the sale of sustainable timber, and ultimately by the sale of the land. So here's an entity that for years and years and years relied on our philanthropic, not Rockefeller, but our sector's philanthropic capital they figured out a way and a wonderful way to continue to fund what they were doing, but at greater scale um, using an impact investing lens. I think that that's sort of one category. Can you make the investment? The second category is to create models for collective action where you, you interact with and create collaborations with other actors in other sectors to do something that you wouldn't as a philanthropy do alone. So um, there's so much attention as we all know in protecting tropical forests at scale. Um, it's estimated that all the forests that still remain on earth uh, store a minimum of 250 billion tons of carbon. Um, and it's an enormous amount um, and very critical um, to the environment, all of our climate change ambitions. So in 2019, the Environmental Defense Fund, the government of Norway and Rockefeller 
um, in the Zero Gap Initiative, build an intermediary. They saw white space and build an intermediary called the Emergent Forest Finance Accelerator. Um, and what it was built to do was finance, uh, to, to be the intermediary, not finance, be, between the companies that wanted carbon offsets and the countries that could give them by forest protection actions. And so, and the, and the companies use their capital in order for the countries to be able to do things um, with offsets, um, mostly in tropical forest uh, jurisdictions that would protect the reductions. So the ultimate goal is to keep the trees standing and to keep the carbon sink intact. It has grown so significantly that when the uh, world leaders met uh, on climate change in 2021, earlier this year, they created a billion dollar coalition called LEAF, lowering emissions by accelerating forest finance. And this entity, Emergent, is the designated intermediary by the world's leaders. And now the coalition includes governments like the US and the UK, corporates such as Bayer and Unilever and Amazon, and several foundations, including <laughs> Rockefeller. So this is a new NGO, a new not-for-profit that is creating this facilitator, facilitator sort of intermediary um, idea. A third category, and then I'll stop, is you can shape bankable projects. So you know that we did a lot of work on resilient cities and the C40 um, is another fantastic network doing work on, on building resilience um, in cities, particularly um, focusing on sustainability. Um, they then made themselves the intermediary to facilitate financing for climate change mitigation and resilience projects in the cities that are members of the C40. Um, and the German Agency for International Cooperation is using them now as the intermediary to these bankable projects. So again, I can go on and on, but what you are seeing is both a groundswell and a huge seismic shift in how all of these sectors, government, the private sector, capital, and us, and the grantees that we fund are acting and interacting um, and scaling um, in just profoundly interesting ways. It is absolutely fascinating. Um, and before we go into questions from the audience, which we're gonna do in a few minutes, Ka Cassie wants me to finish this part of the program right now in a minute or two. Um, all of this leads me to wonder, given, given the uh, people can contribute to social and environmental good and make investment returns, what are the implications for philanthropy? Will traditional philanthropy increasingly become an outdated tool or practice? Well, I, certainly not. Um, I've just <laughs> given a lot of examples of how philanthropy and many of our um, colleagues are on the leading edge of innovation in this space now um, and uh, are creating partnerships. You know, 40 years ago, we used to fund all the groups that would yell at the companies or the governments. And now we're funding all of these interesting sort of interstitial nexes. And that's really important because change occurs in a system. And if we only intervene in one part of the system with our philanthropy, there are all these antibodies in the other parts of the system that work against us. These feel to me like ways to overcome that. So that's number one. And I think number two is there are always going to be things that aren't investable. Thank goodness. And so we don't want to turn everything into a business. Um, one, of my, one of my talks, the head of the San Diego Zoo was uh, in the audience. And she said, what do I have to do with the zoo? to get into this? Do I have to sell my best tiger or? No, we obviously <laughs> don't want 
want that to happen. So there's always going to be a great um, purpose for straight out philanthropy, just like there's always going to be single bottom line investing. But there's all this middle space where all this stuff is happening. That's really interesting. It's absolutely um, fa fascinating. Absolutely. Sorry, finish up. No, that's it. So I, I'm, I'm appropriately critical. Um, you'll see that in the book because we're giving everybody a copy. Um, but I'm also really deeply enthusiastic about the prospects of what it can do. Well, few have done as much as you have in, in, in popularizing this and in giving people an understanding of what the real facts are and what can be done reasonably uh, in the environment that we have. So why don't we now, I thank you all for, and I thank Judy, the presentation. Now come the questions from the audience. Uh, and if you would please indicate that you're interested in asking a question, Cassie will then d d open up your microphone or whatever and, and, um, uh, and give you the opportunity to ask those questions. Cassie, so you're coordinating that, and this is the end. We're going to stop recording the um, the the, the um, session now uh, for for everybody, but we will of course go on uh, without being recorded. He is not okay. quotable after this. Nobody <laughs> nobody can quote you. Um, so, Cassie, would you take over? I would be happy to do so. Uh, we have. Um, Kathy Clark has a question. So Kathy, if you will unmute yourself. And Kathy, say about wrote a word about what you're doing at, at the Fuqua School at Duke. Sure. So Judith, it's very nice to see you again. Um, we, I am faculty director uh, for CASE at Duke, which is the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship. And we've also been running our CASE I3 Impact Investing Initiative since 2011, so this is our 10 year anniversary. And the first thing I have to do is thank you because Rockefeller gave us our first grant, uh, which allowed us to start that initiative that we have been um, running uh, pretty successfully since. And as, as you have traced, you know, the development of the field, um, you know, it's been, a, it's been a really exciting 10 years, right? I think in some ways, much more dramatically changed in terms of the field and its, and its purview than I, I expected. I don't know about you. Um, one of the things that I, that, that we've been working on, and I wanted to get your opinion on, and you had that wonderful slide of showing kind of all the organizations that are trying to standardize. Um, and I, um, have, you know, read your book and part of what I loved about it was you're kind of showing all of the things that are emerging, um, as people try to figure out how to simplify and codify the expectations that we have both on investment funds and on corporates and enterprises. Um, and, but, you know, the, the, the conversation that, that Joel had with you kind of leads to my question, which is, you know, there's just so much skepticism. There's so much enthusiasm by our students for the impact investing marketplace marketplace colliding with the ESG marketplace and, you know, it raining down mana from heaven eventually. Um, but at the moment, it seems as if the two practices, you know, the, 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 the structures are fighting with each other, um, that, that, um, that people can't keep up. Um, and so my question for you is, you know, I was listening to your story about, you know, what is it that philanthropy can do to create a field? And I feel like you guys were extremely successful at Rockefeller at planting seeds for a lot of things. We're now at the point where the corporate sector is trying to basically kind of regulate itself, right? Is trying to come together and say, no, it's, you know, I can't even keep up, right? There were things in your book that I've never seen. I'm sure there's things that, you know, that, that I know about that you've not seen, right? You can't keep up with all the groups that are kind of self-declaring, we have a new standard, now use this. What right. is the role of the public sector? And is it, is, do we need it? Um, and I thought this was an appropriate question for, 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 for our host as well of, you know, what, 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 what is the, what is the pressure point for these industry groups to kind of dumb down the expectations of what they need to report versus a regulatory entity saying, you know, this is what we need to do. And obviously there's different histories of that in Europe and the U.S. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Sorry, that was very so long. I, I think this is a very critical moment 
uh, for two reasons. I think so much last year was so critical in people both recognizing that we have exist real existential threats that aren't something in the future that we're worried about for our grandchildren, but pandemics and climate change and all of those things are really raining down havoc on us right now. One outcome of that was huge, unbelievable amounts of money last year went into ESG funds and impact funds as if that was sort of the solution. It isn't the solution until we get these metrics right and until we have a regulatory framework that really does work. So the EU has been much more muscular um, than the US until now. Um, we see now that the SEC is getting interested under Gary Gensler and we have in Commissioner Lee um, someone who is extremely interested in both the impact space and the ESG space. And like all things that involve policy and money and the private sector, um, a regulatory framework will work, you know, on a completely different issue. I, I'm reading with such kind of glee the fact that once companies said, really motivated to do so by government saying, you have to get vaccinated. Now companies that are telling their employees, you have to get vaccinated. And we're all reading the rates of anti-vaxxers who are getting vaccinated now. Now, they didn't get religion. They're doing it because it's the right combination of government regulation, which wasn't enough, and corporate say-so together, which has made a difference. The same thing will happen in these frameworks. Regulation will not, in the long term, allow them to be dumbed down. But right now, and that is why there's skepticism, when it is the Wild West and everybody's fighting to get their metric being be the one, and that's why these, that's why I showed that slide, why I'm heartened by these collaborations, because there are a lot of actors there who five years ago were fighting with each other that now seem to realize that this has to happen. And then the definition, it's not you know, the definition has to get different and better. When, when two years ago, the MIT report that was written about in the Wall Street Journal showed that three different ESG ratings of, you remember, of Tesla and Exxon produced outcomes in which Exxon was rated higher two of the three times than Tesla on ESG. Now that's incomprehensible, Two of those three ratings had governance as a higher criterion than environmental impact. So all of that's going to get sorted out. I, I, I am really confident of that. There's a lot of uh, pressure for that to happen. Um, and I think the regulators, again, particularly in the EU, got really nervous when they saw how much money poured in last year. And that is why they're being more aggressive on the on creating on I'm pushing a regulatory regime and why in the government you saw all these G7 task forces, which emerged. They're very new, just at the last G7 meeting. Um, and I, I think that's for the good. Great, thank you. Okay, Cassie, next. Yes, uh, Lori O'Keefe, if you'll unmute and ask your question. And identify yourself. Thank you, thank you, Kathy. Yes, Cassie. Um, I'm Lori O'Keefe. I lead Triangle Community Foundation. We are a community foundation based here and we serve four counties here in the Durham, Raleigh, Chapel Hill, Chatham County area. And we've seen a lot of growth in our ESG portfolio. I think one of our biggest challenges is ESG seems to be defined differently depending on what your, what your focus is. And because we are a community foundation that is made up primarily of donor advised funds, um, We've been trying to think about ways to give our donors more opportunities to invest locally. So we're 
launching, um, we actually launched it in March of 2020 and then COVID, um, but we are relaunching an impact fund where we're, we're going to place some of our assets and invite other donors to participate with us for some local you know, housing um, funds, small business loans, working through some of our CDFIs because we don't have the capacity to understand what the deal flow is. But one of the strange chicken and eggs we're having right now is it seems like we can identify donors, but we're struggling with how we identify deal flow in a way that is accessible to all, you know, where there's a lot of things going on in communities where certain um, businesses and organizations don't have access to the networks that have the capital. And so I'm wondering if you have any, um, if you have any uh, advice or examples of ways that you've kind of democratized the deal flow process in, in some of these investments. Yeah, there's, I don't know them directly, but I'm struck by seeing um, some online resources developing where a deal flow is being shared. So I, I, you'll look for that. I can't give you specific names because I don't want to advocate for entities that I really don't know anything about, but I'm seeing the growth of that where they're saying that you know, we have the expertise to create the pipeline of deals and then create a market basket that you, the investor, whether you're an individual investor or a small foundation or an aggregator of donor advised funds, that you can pick from uh, depending on what your particular interest areas are. That's why I gave you the gender and um, girls and women kind of thing, because you can say we're interested in racial equity or we're interested in environmental justice or we're interested in small business development um, and then find partners who can identify the deal flow for you. Uh, I think even in the earliest days, we actually, and the monitor report convinced us of this, that the deals were there it's just the money didn't, wasn't organized in a way to find them. The only admonition I would give you is that this is capitalism. It's not philanthropy. And so you're not looking for the 20 year patient investment, which we all do with our philanthropy in, in a lot of things you really are looking for a true double bottom line investment. And it's nice that you have donor advised funds because you may have expertise among people who have created their own donor advised funds that could help those companies that they're investing in. Um, and that's why, you know, like the Good Life Pharmacy, um, take bringing the VC model to double bottom line investing, which sort of TPG Rise and, and others were a good uh, leapfrog and others were early in, was really important because the VC model is that they really do get engaged with those companies and help them evolve and help them succeed. Um, and I think that's critical. It's not just blind investing like we do it with our endowments you know, where we have managers and it's kind of arm's length. So I find this really exciting for that reason and, and should be to your donors. All right, the next person is Andrew Jacobson. If you'll unmute yourself, introduce yourself and ask your question. Jory, thank you so much for, for having me and, and Judah, thank you for the talk so far and Joel, thank you for hosting. Uh, my name is Andrew Jacobson. I work with uh, early stage VC investment, Michael Eisenberg out of Tel Aviv. Uh, heard about the event through our, through our good friend, uh, Jeff, Jeff Swartz. And um, one thing Michael is kind of pursuing now, uh, he's always kind of doing something, something new and ambitious, but what it's, it's what he calls values create value, um, where it's, it's not exactly ESG or, or CSR or some or kind of one of these impact models where you're kind of pursuing impact a bit on the side. What he's trying to pursue now is, is kind of where you put um, values or principles at the core of the business model itself. 
Um, so you could take Lemonade, the insurance company, as an example, where the portion of claims that are not paid out to the, to the customer is actually good for charity. Um, so then customers are not incentivized to overinflate their claims. Um, you have a company called Rise Up, a fintech company that's actually incentivized to increase the credit scores of its uh, customers rather than decrease it um, so that they're more uh, sustainable customers in the long run. So I'm just wondering what you think about these kinds of models where you're actually hitting a double bottom line uh, in the core of the business model as opposed to kind of ESG or, or skilled art. Yeah, I, I think ESG is much more relevant as a label for large public equities um, who have multiple business lines um, and uh, start out, you know, small in terms of maybe their impact. But we're seeing huge transitions in other kinds of companies. I, I gave you the example of Orsted. So they're no longer at all an oil and gas company. The, the ultimate goal is for these companies to create social and environmental good in everything they do or in as many things they do as possible. But the value-driven company that has a line of business where their value and their values are aligned is the company I'm most interested in because they are building a future um, and they're doing it in a way that's aligned with the values of their investors, but not, you know, as this field evolved, not every investor is like Michael and they don't want that. So there are clashes between value and values sometime between investors and companies that, that have that kind of values driven mandate and mission. Um, Joel mentioned earlier that I'm, um, you know, I'm in a new phase of my life, not retirement, um, but I'm taking my experience as a CEO and this work, which I'm so interested in, and I'm working with the kinds of companies that you described, mentoring young founders, really using strategic, my both experience and sort of strategic chops to help them grow and to help them really demonstrate that you can grow significantly, um, really significantly when you align value and values. So that's that's this, this stage of my career. So I'm, I'm excited that there are others um, who feel that way. And Andrew, if you want to have uh, Judy's um, email address to contact her for such purposes of let me know and, and we'll, we'll provide it with you if she's willing. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Thank you, Joel. And my pleasure. Okay, Cassie. All right. The next person who has a question is Susan King. If you'll unmute yourself, introduce yourself and ask your question. She explains it's a bit off topic, perhaps. So this should be an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> So, Judith, we worked together a little bit when I was at Carnegie around some big initiatives around Africa. I'm now dean of the School of Journalism. And so this is big, a little bit off topic, but when you talked about student activism and mentioned it, now you both twice mentioned racial equity funds. So put that. I wanted to explore just a little bit your thoughts from what you're doing now, but in the bigger uh, question. So sort of the summer before racial reckoning, is our students really focused, you know, on sort of big questions of as journalists and as communicators, and also the idea of black wealth that I don't think many people thought about before, and the lack of building black wealth because of policies in the country, et cetera. And I'm just wondering if that is a piece of some of this, and and what then becomes the reparations questions becomes one that's on the um, on the. Uh, platform. So it's a bit off topic, but with all the work that you did, I'd love your insights. For sure. Um, and it really isn't off topic. So when I said last year that billions started pouring into these kinds of funds, um, some of those billions were environmental and ESG, but a lot of those billions were for the first time because of Black Lives Matter and the uh, increasing and broader scale focus 
on ec racial equity and, and the fact that in so many places, um, the access to the kinds of things we've been talking about for the last hour and a half start with mostly fund managers who are mostly white, investing in mostly, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, both Alphabet, Bank of America, and a couple others have um, floated last year multi-billion dollar racial justice uh, entrepreneur access bonds. And these funds are raised specifically to do what you said, which is invest in companies founded by or led by people of color or greater, you know, more a more diverse, to work with um, money management teams who are largely people of color and to help them. I mean, many of them are quite sophisticated, um, but those that haven't had as much access to large, large scale capital to give them the kind of access to sovereign wealth funds, for example, that many of the more traditional funds do. Um, and, and these folks have been not as able to gain access to, et cetera, et cetera. So this is new. Um, and I think it's exciting. We'll see if it's a flash in the pan response to last year and then everybody goes back to business as usual. I don't know. Um, but a lot of us are watching how it's shaping up and what impact it will really have. Um, and I think it is quite interesting and it's, it's critically important. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, Judy. Okay, Cassie, next question. I don't have anyone else in line in the chat. So opening it up for anyone else who may have a question. Any other last minute questions? If not, let me take this opportunity to thank Judy for a, a, a stunning um, uh, range of issues and fascinating. I don't know anybody who has, who has been in a better position to oversee, to oversee the development of this field than she has, given her combination of leadership of the Rockefeller Foundation and her leadership of a number of corporations. Um, uh, it's an amazing kind of combination of talents that has enabled her to talk about what she's talked about uh, with such clarity uh, without confusing everybody. Um, I don't feel confused. Uh, I think that, I think that so maybe I'm uh, not listening, but nonetheless, I find the presentation, Judy, really uh, impressive uh, and informative um, as I did the book. And so you, you will get a copy of the book. If you'd like one, uh, let Cassie know, uh, and I encourage you to read it. Very interesting. It's the best summary I've ever seen of the issues dealing with this question. Um, that is, you know, um, uh, impact investing, mission investing, um, uh, multiple bottom lines, all of those problems. Uh, I, I, I don't know another book like it. Uh, uh, it is full and it's also thin. So many of the books that are as comprehensive as this are not this thin. Um, as I'm, I, I've got, here's the, here's the book. There you go. And you can see it's thin. And thin oh, one, one student, we want classes. So I hope you'll use it in a <laughs> class at Duke because the reason it's thin is uh, we wanted to pack a lot in, but we also really hoped that it would be used in courses that focused on this increasingly important issue. Well, maybe we can get you to teach a class at Duke. <laughs> my husband <laughs> <laughs> that's right well listen it, please give uh, paul my warm regards thank you so much for making the time available and for scheduling it uh, it's really been an eye opener for me to, to see your to read your book and also to hear you speak today and i thank everybody who participated and i wanted to we, this is first time we've ever had a back-to-back -back presentation um series but we do and we've got 
another tomorrow, uh, we're having another Ferg presentation, um, and that's going to be in person. Unfortunately, Judy wanted, was on the West Coast and said she would rather do it virtually rather than rather than in person. But tomorrow starts our sequence of other Ferg presentations, uh, and tomorrow we've got Greg Baer, the executive director of the Grable Foundation, um, in uh, Pittsburgh, who is one of the leaders in reform in education uh, in in that in Pittsburgh, who's also written a book, um, the title of which is "If You're Wondering, You're Learning," um, and uh, and it and uh, he's he is a, I have to say a Duke alumnus. Uh, Judy is not a Duke alumnus. Her son is a Duke alumnus, um, and. One, sometime when you more, you have more time, you're interested. I can tell you a little bit about her son, Alex Nigelo, who was one of the most interesting students at Duke. For one of the reasons he was bright and serious, and for another reason, he enlisted to work with the Durham Police Department and ride around with them in cars with pistols. <laughs> and they, very, very venturesome at, at an early time. But in any event, so tomorrow is uh, uh, the standard uh, afternoon session in the um, in the Rhodes Conference Center at Duke. Um, and then um, about three weeks later, two weeks later, uh, Billy Shore, who founded Share Our Strength and End Kid Hunger, um, is speaking also in person. Um, and then that's October the 27th. On uh, Wednesday, November, 7th, November 7th, Steve Tobin, president of the Flora Family Foundation, which is the family component of the Hewlett family and the Hewlett Foundation. And finally, we have a visitor from Israel for the first time um, uh, on December the 8th, Ellie Hurwitz, who is the director of the Eddie and Jules Trump Family Foundation, not to be confused with any relative of the other Trump, um, who has been running a, a major interesting program in, in, in encouraging uh, the, the, the growth of, um, of mathematics, science, and engineering STEM courses in the, in the Israeli school curriculum. Uh, and it's made really prog great progress in increasing the numbers. So that's it. Um, and you, instead of being able to getting 10 minutes back, you're getting only five minutes back of your time. <laughs> but, but in any event, it's been wonderful having all of you with us. Thank and you all. Thank you, especially. I look forward to seeing you again soon. And if you let decide that you will teach a course on this at Duke, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you all so much. This thank you all. Thank you, Cassie, for all your organizational help. Bye-bye.